Today, I'm going on a sartorial journey with broadcaster Makita Oliver. 38-year-old Makita has been on TV since she was 16, when she began presenting Channel 4's cult Sunday morning pop culture show, Pop World. She went on to present T4 from 2006 to 2010. She's worked in radio, hosting shows on BBC Radio 1 and BBC Radio 1 Extra. In 2022, Makita and her mother, TV chef and presenter Andy Oliver, featured in a BBC television series, The Caribbean, with Andy and Makita. Starting out in Antigua, where they met members of their extended family, reconnected with their Antiguan heritage, and illuminated the island's history and culture. And most recently, Andy and Makita have appeared on Celebrity Gogglebox together. Hello and welcome, Makita. Hello, Amanda. I would love your voice to read me lullabies, to <laughs> sing me lullabies. That is so kind. Read me bedtime stories, that's it. I'm, my dog doesn't seem to think the same, <laughs> but I mean, hopefully my partner thinks that. It's very soft and nurturing. I was like, oh, I feel safe now. I've loved watching your journey and I love the fact that you are working so much with your mum. Yes. How has that been? I love working with mum. I, I think... It's weird. I guess broadcasting is almost the family business for, yeah. for her and I. And um, and it, she she's very good at what she does and wasn't celebrated for it for a long time and sort of did bits and pieces. And I fell into this very big career as a teenager. So it's sort of like we did the reverse way of things. Like I became really successful in this industry and she wasn't. And then it sort of turned around and my career kind of had a stall and I went through a lot and, had, you know, everything that happens after you've been on TV for 15 years, you have a bit of a nervous breakdown. I have oh. to look at your life again. And then my mum's career started to ascend. And then my career came back. And so we sort of met in this beautiful place where we're doing everything we've always wanted to do at the same time, which I don't think always happens in life. So I feel really lucky. And people say, oh, do you, do you get on with your mum? It's not really about that. It's a magical thing to make television that people love and feel with someone that you love. So so you've been on this magical journey, but 16 years old when you started, I mean, how did that happen? West London, I'd say, probably had something to do with it. I grew up on, um, in Westman Park by Portobello and Labrick Grove, and it was a very... You know, it was the late 90s, early noughties. Well, I suppose it was, the, it was like 2000. It was like just the new millennium. And there was a good air in West London. There was a lot of creativity. Yeah. It wasn't as wild as 192 kind of brilliant days in the 90s, but there was a, there was a lot going on. And um, my mum and I had lived there for a very long time. So we sort of knew everyone. And um, a TV producer, wonderful TV producer who changed my life called Tamsin, just an old friend of my mum's, remembered me from a dinner party. Um, and they had, Channel 4 had commissioned a new music show. They had got Simon Amstel, but they'd been looking for a girl for a few months and they'd sort of gone the stage school route and hadn't really found anything that they wanted, but they also didn't really know what they were looking for because what Popwell became is not what it was commissioned as. Um, and uh, my mum said, Tamsin wants to know if you want to audition for this music show I was like absolutely not it sounds terrifying and really overwhelming and, and I've, I was just I'd been to like all these different schools and I hadn't settled and I was just settled and just starting to do my GCSEs um so I was like no I don't want I don't want to do that but she was like you're you can not go to science for the afternoon I had double science and she was like you won't have to go that like, is any girl's dream <laughs> not like, go to science and just do a little audition well I just I find auditions I think I did like one theatre audition as a kid and I got such bad anxiety and I, I've never, I do since getting the job, but when I was very young, I didn't deal with nerves well and I just didn't want to be nervous. Um, but of course, the greatest things in life are on the other side of what we're terrified of. And I got there and it was just like, um, like Goodwill Hunting when he says, like Mozart, I could just play when he's talking about how his mathematician mind works. I just knew how to do it, Amanda. And I don't know why, but I just, I mean, possibly because of mum, but it was deeper than that. I just understood the rhythm of it very quickly. And we left and I was like, I want that job. And my mum was like, remember you're 16, it might not happen. And you know, it was a good experience. I was like, I want that job. How magical. So did you drop out of school at that point? Yeah, a week later they offered it to me and uh, <laughs> me and mum were a bit like, what? Because it was going to be on every day 
Um, cause it was launching E4. That's how long yeah. that was. Um, and it was gonna be on channel four as well. And they were gonna pay me like this a certain amount of money. And I was just like, I was very overwhelmed. And then my mom's like, she's still in school. And they said, okay. So they changed the filming schedule so that I would go to school, do pop one in the mornings, have lunch and then go to school. So I'd be like, wake up, like interview like Nelly or like Usher. Have That's lunch bonkers. and then go to like PE. <laughs> it was really, it was a very weird time, but uh, but it was exciting, uh, very exciting. But my body came out in this huge rash, and so I think a part of me was freaking out. Oh, I'm not surprised. Mm. I mean, 16 is you're you're a kid. Yeah, I suppose you are. But that and that's a huge, huge job with mm. huge interviewing, as you were saying, huge names. I was just always around creative people, people that were in big bands and were big people in television. And also the kind of more squatty <laughs> roughnecks from West London. So it was a real mixture of people that I had been brought up with. So I wasn't that phased by an Atomic Kitten or a member of Blue or even an Usher. I would just... I, I was never that overwhelmed by fame. I just, I just thought it was quite interesting to be able to talk to all these different people. So coming back to now, any other exciting projects up your sleeve? Sort of four years ago, I started working really hard to get back to a place that I had previously been, but actually I knew I wanted to go a lot higher and I have. And I think you have to, oh God, it takes a lot to decide to put yourself back in the world to say that I'm a broadcaster, this is what I do, I love it and I want to work again and I want to do more and I want to do bigger things and I want to be trusted with big things. It's really hard. What was the catalyst that made you decide that you were ready for that? I think I was bored, yeah. And I don't like being bored. And I realized it's because I wasn't using my mind much. And if you're a broadcaster, you have to be hired to work. You can't just sit around broadcasting at home yeah. like a painter might paint. Yeah. And I was always too scared to kind of ask for my place in the industry again. And then suddenly I just wasn't. Suddenly I just wasn't scared. I was ready spiritually and physically. I've been training really hard. I'd lost a lot of weight. I was really in my body. Me and my body were very connected. Me and my mind were very connected. Oh, I started therapy. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> crucial. That's crucial part of the story. I started therapy and I got to talk about everything that had happened. And I'd never really talked about it. It was just like, oh yeah, I got really famous and I did that show and I became a TV presenter. But actually it was a, a lot and it was a real, a, a really difficult thing to talk about because I never thought I could. I found it, thought people would be like, who cares if you got a bit famous? But actually being famous is a very odd thing, especially if you haven't hunted it out. And if you have it from that age, like now I've been famous longer than I haven't been. I've never been an adult who hasn't been well known, yeah. which is quite a lot. And it took a lot of therapy to be able to explain that. Every single person down the street shouting my name, everyone knowing you, cause you're on the telly. So you, everyone thinks that- And, and you're 16. You grow up. Yeah, 16, they're sort of, it was a lot, but now it's brilliant because everyone says to me, I grew up watching you. I grew up watching you. And I feel like I've got all these people through their school, through their uni. <laughs> That's what I realized. I thought, hang on, if people still say, thank you, you got me through this, or I loved watching you in this, then I know there's a reason for me to be back in that world and to do it again. Um, Mum and I are also doing a lot more travel after the Caribbean success. That was such a beautiful experience. Um, to do to do something like that for the BBC was really special, but it was so loved. We cannot go anywhere without many, many people talking to us about how much it opened up conversations in their family, yeah. about heritage, ancestry. Yeah. This is not just a black story. We had Polish, Russian, Jewish, I mean, uh, Asian, everyone just saying thank you. And we suddenly realized that this is a really important thing for us to keep doing, to keep traveling and keep showing parts of the world and talking about ancestry. Um, so that's what we're doing next. Um, your Instagram post on International Women's Day, I found that so powerful where you were reflecting on being criticized about your appearance, your hair and how you presented yourself. It was so brave, so raw. What what inspired you with that post? Thank you. Um, I, well, I was asked to do this job for Banerjee, which are a huge production company conglomerate, um, to tell other women's stories. And then they asked me if I had one. And I immediately went to sexual harassment, 
feeling sexually threatened, all those things. And I didn't, I've never had any experience like that. And I'm very lucky, especially noughties, 16. But people were just too involved with drugs and, drugs and alcohol to be bothered to do anything like that. It was, I felt very protected actually, my whole career. But this was a story of a time where I felt like I was torn apart and broken down and the, who I was and how it would affect me to, to have that conversation was never thought about or taken into account. And I realized that in TV at that time, there wasn't that kind of nurture that w of like one spirit that wouldn't have come I was going to say, would that happen today, do you think? No way. Yeah. And not even just because people are being careful. I think we just, we just, you just wouldn't relate to a, I was 23 and she was 55. And it's quite difficult because she's sort of family friend as well. It was just a really difficult situation for me. And I thought it was really important to say, to say something because the nuance of the negative things we've been through as women in the workplace is really important. It's not just as black and white as uh, this happened, se I was sexually harassed, I was sexually threatened, or I felt limited. It's like, you have to tell the story. If I just mm. said they criticized my hair, you'd be like, all right. But it was just the atmosphere that it created around me. And it was very quickly after that, that I was um, let go of T from T4. And I'd given them 10 to 12 years of my life. And really? it was very hard to- I mean, your whole adult life. My whole adult life, yeah. And I was very confused and lost. And there was no one to go, are you gonna be okay? And I think today there would be. Good. Mm, so progress. For that, exactly. But today we're going on a style journey Yay! together. So I'd love to know, were you exposed to fashion at a very young age? You know, I think of you growing up in West London and I know how creative West London is. God, it's where all of us designers go to to get inspiration. Right. Um, did, were you conscious of, of style and fashion at a young age? Age? Absolutely. Um, I think, but what I was always very, and this is why I like secondhand clothes, what I was always very interested in is what people wear. My grandmother is Antiguan, and when she came over to Britain, you know, everyone wore their Sunday best. Mm. And they came from a generation of people who were makers. They had to make everything. Yeah. And there's a picture of my um, family from the 1920s, my grandmother and her six sisters and her seven brothers and my great grandmother, mama, and my great great grandmother, Eleanor, and my great grandfather, papa. And thank God we got the picture because they were poor. So it's, it's quite strange that they have this picture, but they all put on their Sunday best. Oh, how charming. It's beautiful. Amanda, it looks like mini Chanel, Armani. Like oh. it's just so chic. And the pride. And the pride, exactly. So I think that. I've always been interested in cuts and details because I come from a family of makers. Were you in a uniform at school? N um, one of them. And it was, because I went to six different schools, absolutely not until then. And then when I was 14, we had to move out of Portobello because we lost our housing trust flat and we moved to it. Just a little bit more like Kilburn Maid of Ale. And I went to St. George's, um, a rough school, but it had a uniform. And it was the first time I tried to hide a part of myself. I was at the time very into grunge and Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins and Hole. And I used to wear Dr. Martens and whatever, I was on one. And I was terrified because I was mixed race. And at that time, not very close to my blackness at all. I was terrified that I'd be found out by all the black kids that I dressed basically like a white kid. So I used the uniform in the week to be like them. And then at the weekend I would dress how I wanted, but I would like be in hiding. I'd be like, God, if I see one person from school, like, you know, the real fear, I was like, it's over for me. And it would, probably would have been because I created such a persona. So I thought, when I left that school, I thought uniforms are weird. They make me hide. I should never wear one again. <laughs> but yeah, any hangover from that other than the the hiding? But do, do you remember the fabrics of it, the oh, cut? Yeah. The... I liked it. I liked it was well cut and I liked that it was navy and white. I thought it was chic. You must be the only person I've interviewed who loved that uniform. Really? But actually, the way you describe it, I think... Oh, that sounds really like chic. Mew I can Mew. see you in right. it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Mew Mew on, on a shrunken scale. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but do you, do you remember your very first memory of when clothes had an impact on you? 
Yeah. And what that was and what, what, what you were wearing. I think I was four, three or four, and my cousin Phoebe would have been three or four because we're two months apart. And my uncle Sean, my mum's um, brother, who passed away when he was 27, um, had this very big life in, he was a, huge, a hugely gifted musician. Everyone in West London knew him. Most pretty girls had had a night with him. <laughs> he was a bit <laughs> of a Casanova. The most handsome man that's ever lived. He had dreads and he, like we all did. I mean, you got to remember everyone was skin. So it wasn't like everyone was buying secondhand clothes at the charity shop. That's just where you bought your clothes. He'd wear these gray suits that looked like Armani with like, beating up old Adidas, I'll show you the picture. We did a shoot for ID magazine and we got to pick what we wore. And I remember being like, okay, let's go. And I was very specific. And the outfit is so banging, I'd wear it today. It's like lovely little kilt with a gray jumper with a red stripe here, red tights, and then little black painted Mary Janes. I was like, oh, go on. <laughs> I would and, say and that. Did, did you just feel a million dollars in it? Yes, I just remembered that I liked putting things together and I felt proud of what I'd put together. And a few, like maybe a year or two later, my auntie Nana got married and she said we could design our bridesmaid dresses. And that's when I was like, right, okay. Cause it was with a, li oh, a liar. Cause he'd made her dress. Oh my God. Yeah. So he'd made this beautiful see-through, um, navy polka dot wrap little oh my god it was beautiful and then poor Elia had <laughs> these sketches from these children that were like poofy but I was really specific about the silk and the pink I was like it's bubblegum pink but it's kind of lighter than that and it's got to be like soft to oh touch I was like five was the like, thought okay. of Azadine and I bet you he just I mean, created was... something very beautiful they were gorgeous and and that day did you how how did it pan out? We were nightmares. Did it deliver? <laughs> it delivered. Did the dress deliver? The, dr the dress was better than our attitude that day. We were just nightmares. There was like <laughs> five of us and we, Nana was late and we, we just, yeah. We were just five. <laughs> I love the idea that Azadine Elia <laughs> did both Nana's dress and, and the little you five yeah. rates. <laughs> Do you think that a fashion mojo can come in and out of your life? Definitely. Yes. Definitely. And I do also think that it can come in phases. Yes. And, you know, when I think back to myself in the 80s and then myself starting my business and I was sort of wearing serious business stuff. Yes. And now I'm definitely dressing younger now than I probably was 30 years yes, ago. Yes, absolutely. I remember turning 30 and thinking, oh my God, I can't believe I have to give mini skirts up. And then one day I went, no, I don't. And I've had my best mini skirts wearing life in my 30s. I had a real fashion mojo at like five, then again at like 10. But then I think the way it came back at 33, 34, was the kind of deepest it's ever been. I started dressing from the soul and I never used to wear color. And I started being really interested in tangerines and greens and purples. And I realized that I was going back to the kind of like the way all my grandma and her sisters dress in the Caribbean, like church clothes, neat trousers, neat jumper, good shirt, tailored jackets, kitten heels. I think our style runs so much deeper than we really know. You think that you're just putting something on, but actually there are all these reasons that you I, gravitate to stuff. I think, you know, I call it your style DNA. I, I think it's almost, it goes round in these circles mm. and, and you evolve and then you realize, ooh, I'm back to where I started. Yes, that's but a different it. But a, a different sort of version. newer version of it. Everything you've learned in between. Yes. Yeah, so you come at, out on the other side a lot more powerful and a lot more trusting of yourself and your instincts and your gut. Now that's something I wanted to talk to you about because I know you're a genius secondhand shopper and and <laughs> no and you really are and I I think style and styling is a very subjective thing um, and I know that throughout my years as a designer I found women came to Amanda Wakely because they trusted my style um, my aesthetic they they were perhaps less confident in their own aesthetic and I, what I tried to do was provide them with the solutions but Secondhand shopping is a whole other challenge. You don't have the stamp of sort of good taste that comes from buying a brand that you trust, for example. Um, you actually have to trust your own taste. And I think that can be super challenging for the majority of people. And I just wondered if you, this consummate secondhand shopper, had any tips 
yeah, I think it's quite a big question to walk into a shop and say, who am I? And to trust your gut and your instinct, which is why I honestly think that after I did a lot of therapy and a lot of work on my ancestry because of the show with mum, uh, I started getting even more free and even more excited about what I would find in charity shops. So I think it really is a question of where you're at in your head and how much you trust yourself. But I got bored, Amanda, I just got so bored. I used to love Zara, but I just got so bored of the same, it felt like the same conversation was being had over and over again. And I, I people go, this is so great that you're so into sustainability. Honestly, it feels good to wear secondhand clothes and to be putting money in the right place. And for me, that is a good way of living sustainably when you're doing something for yourself, for other people, the community around you and the planet. And I think there is a stigma that charity shops can be dirty or badly organized or ha have no knowledge, uh, not knowledgeable staff. And they're all untrue, um, especially these days. And it really is just a more exciting ride. And you always look like an individual. Yes, because there's, you know, it, it's how do we encourage people out of that? Well, this is the look in the latest Saint Laurent ad or the latest Celine ad or whatever, and people just wanting to reproduce that. But it's how we dig deep into ourselves and mm. say, I'm actually, this feels really good. But in terms of the, the secondhand shopping, do you... Do you ever take selfies of yourself? Oh, God, um, yeah, you can't to, stop me. To work out whether something works or not? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you take selfies? Yes, in the dressing room. To work room. out whether... What I'm going to actually do, like, I take pins, I'm, I'm going to take it up to this length, and... Because I, I... But do you pin yourself? Yeah, just in the dressing rooms. Just to see if I'm actually going to bother to do it. Because sometimes... Because the skirt's only three quid, you're like, oh, I'll just get it. It's like, no, still think about whether you want this. Yeah. But what you were saying earlier about the um, uh, Celine campaign, like Yves Saint Laurent and people wanting to, I love campaigns and I love fashion magazines and I love shows. I love, my favorite thing to do is recreate what I see there in a charity shop. But it has been said about you that you have an encyclopedic knowledge of fashion references. A sweater is very Celine 2012, addresses season three Carrie falling into the pond when she's surprised by Big. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. but everyone now goes, ah, yeah, I know what you mean. Like, I just think popular cultural references to clothes are always really important. And, and it also, um, I read that, you know, you've had, you have a commitment to buying exclusively secondhand, although occasionally makes an exception for a posh shoe. <laughs> Can we talk about those posh shoes and what they might be? Okay, this actually comes back to ancestry because I love kitten heels, like so, from such a deep, pure place that I don't even know what it's about, but now I do because I looked at all the pictures of my ancestors and my and my grandmother and all her sisters and all my great aunts, and they're all in these satin, oh, like oh, white, beautiful, pearl, light pink, light blue kitten heels. Mm. And I don't know where that com comes from, one back, but maybe to look neat. Um, as black people uh, coming over here, you wanted to look your best. I don't know, but it's in me. And so I'm sorry, but no one makes a kitten here like Manolo Blahnik. I'm not gonna, <laughs> if someone did, I would buy it. But I think that they are treasures and they, f they fill me up with joy. So honestly, how many pairs of shoes do you have? I'd say 60. All designer? Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. But all my skirts cost a quid, Amanda. So it really. <laughs> yeah, the pounds out. per wear yes. sort of averages out. Absolutely. If you had five minutes to get camera ready, what is the outfit that you'd reach for? At the moment, I'd say um, camera ready. Yeah. I'd say mini skirt neat stripy jumper although you're not allowed to wear stripes on camera which is always <sighs> so upsetting um but very neat little jumper good prada men's belt manolo's bare legs some gold hoops done gorgeous <laughs> gorgeous do you think you message through your clothes yeah, I was always really interested in, there was of course the revenge dress with Diana, but I was always really interested in when Kate had that scandal and Kate Moss, um, and then was in New York the next day, knew it, knowing she'd be photographed. And she was in a white crocheted mini dress. And it honestly was the, uh, the it was like a act of innocence. 
And I remember thinking, God, clothes are powerful. She's very clever. Yeah. And I think that there are times, I sort of, it's deeper than message. I, I've used clothes to, to do everything in my life, to, to make my life bigger, to cure heartbreak, to heal myself, to have no fear. Yeah, to feel the world around me. I, d I don't think there's anything I don't use clothes for. But that's lovely that you're so connected to what you're putting on your body. Yeah. Can we talk about your hair for a minute? Mm. I know that that was um, talked about in that horrible interview that you had mm. um, back in the day. You spoke very openly about having a weave mm. and how much... You, you actually really hated that. Mm. And so how, how did you move on from that and evolve to just loving your gorgeous curly <laughs> locks? Um, well, um, I, uh, it's funny. Everyone thinks these are locks. They're actually just plaits. Yeah. And I, this is basically the hairstyle I had when I was it's sort of seven to 13. So it really took me back to who I was before yeah. I got my job and everything changed in my life and I wasn't visible in the same way. Um, I took a lefty four and I ripped the weave out because it was something that I was told to get to be on camera. Because oh. I had curly, from day one, they were like, and are you gonna get, a, we sort of tried, but there was a lot of like, this is difficult. This is quite hard. And it, as a kid, you're just like, I'm sorry. It's just my hair. I did have lots of big curly hair, which I can't see. it was beautiful. Mm. And then my mum was like, you're not getting a weave. I'm never letting you do that to your hair. And I was like, no, I have to for, for screen. They've asked me to. I think maybe they didn't ask me, but it was alluded to. And then when I got it, they were all very happy. And then I had it for 10 years and, I just, and it ruined my hair and I hated it. Cause I'm not really a very like groomed, groomed person. So I'm not one of those girls who like ties their hair in a scarf at night, like no way. And I was like out as well, like <laughs> grouchos like Lily. Like I was All not- night. Yeah, I was not like going, let me just, my hair routine can't suffer. So at the end of it, it was rather lopsided because I didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I didn't even, I didn't even- um, The uninvited guest. It was like the uninvited guest. And the interesting thing about weavers, you don't have a connection with your scalp or the top of your head or your energy. It all feels like it's going and then being stifled. So when I took it out, I suddenly was like, oh my God, I haven't like had the energy of like, all my thoughts and my ideas and who I am just coming out into the world. Or feeling the sun feeling on your Feeling the sun on your scalp, on your all those head, things. Yeah. Some women, a, a lot of women look beautiful because they look after their extensions. I'm just not like that. Um, and I think one day I just put my hair into four plaits and I was like, oh my God, plaits. Because I used to always plait my own hair from the age of about six. And then I was like, I'll just do six. And then I suddenly did 10 and then I did 20 and I was like, <gasps> I'm back. <laughs> oh, how lovely. It was a really in spiritual, interesting experience. I was like, oh my God, I, this is how my hair always was. And, and, now, um, and now I just love it. I sing to it, look after it. And I'm very connected to my hair again. And I see a lot of black girls with plaits now. And it means I, I, I know what a big deal that is because we were all stifled by the, the, this pathway of the only route to your hair being acceptable is a weave. And now girls have, you know, extension plaits, but they're just, I can feel everyone's more connected to themselves. I, and I love the craft and mm. the patterns. And yeah. I mean, I, I, I actually look at some of those hairstyles and, and really have hair envy yeah. because oh, they're, wow. they're like pieces of art. Yes, I mean, absolutely. a friend of mine the other day, I looked at her plaits and it was, honestly, she looked like the back of her head looked like a sculpture. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. And it brings a sort of regality black, back, yes. to, back to black beauty. That's and a really good word. Mm, I think that's what's happening. I think there's a lot of pride yeah. in black hair again. Yes. And, the, and weaves allude to hiding a part of and, yourself. And super creativity mm. too. I mean, it's a real adornment. Yes, absolutely. It, you know, sod hats. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but talking about being connected to yourself, would you say your weight or your perception of your body has affected your choices in what to wear? 
I think, I mean, yeah, there was, a, a, listen, putting on weight on camera is not fun. And I was always a very skinny kid. And then at about 23, I put on a lot of weight and I couldn't really get it off. I, yeah, I just couldn't get it off. So I think 23 to 27 on screen, I was about two and a half, three stone heavier than I've no. been before. Wow. So that's a lot of weight to put on and be on TV. I think I, I well, saw TV is so brutal so anyhow. Brutal. I think it was like kind of, I went down and up, but I just was in turmoil with it. And I started to only wear dresses. And I don't really love dresses. I mean, I do, but not like a skirt and a top. But I decided that dresses would be where I'd hide. And it completely changed the way I wanted to dress, which was really frustrating because I still knew how I wanted to dress. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't get there. I couldn't get the body I wanted to wear the things I wanted. Um, so I felt quite trapped. Um, and it's very difficult to lose weight and start focusing on yourself and do all the things that it took for me to get into shape now when you're on screen three times a week and you're tired and it's been 10 years of your life and I just was not in the right headspace to look after myself. How did it feel to have the press permanently talking about your weight? Horrible, so horrible. And again, now, would they be that cruel? I don't know. But like Lily's wedding, oh my God, they were so awful to me. I think they call me her big fat bridesmaid because of like my big fat Greek Whoa. wedding had come out. And that was like a big day for us as a family. And I was Lily's head bridesmaid, but I, I knew I didn't feel good. Oh. And um, to have it, it was all over the papers the next day. And Lily was really, I sort of, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of hard to discuss with each other as friends. We, I just felt like I'd embarrassed her. Oh no. Yeah, it was and really And she hard. would not feel that at all. No, I think she probably felt devastated yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, it's okay, we're both really in good shape now. We look great. That's <laughs> why we all got through it. Silver lining. Yeah, silver lining. Who knew that actually our 30s would be a hell of a lot better than our 20s? It but gets better and better. It does get better and better. I promise you that. I thought people were lying. It's no. no. It's no lie. It is no lie, no I promise lie. you. Would you say you have a style icon? I don't think there's only one person. Maybe Cher in the 70s. Oh, God, yeah. <gasps> yeah, Cher. But if I asked you to sum up your style in three words, or how you would want someone to describe you in three words, if that makes it easier. I guess neat. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. my hair is always like, you know, plaits and curly. So I like to counter out that with being quite neat. Um, sharp and true. I like that. I like that. You, okay, good. Do you have one item of clothing that means the most to you? Yeah, I, yeah. It was this... Um, it wasn't the Alaya Bridesmaid dress. No, <laughs> which it really should be. The bubble gum really thing. be archived. <laughs> Do you know what? It was a dress that looks very similar to that. That's so weird. That's so... Oh, my God. I think maybe I was... That's why I was drawn to this dress. Um, it, it's, it's quite recent in my life, but it means so much to me. Um, when we were in the Caribbean, we interviewed this artist called Sheena Rose, and she makes all this beautiful art, and she had made one dress, just one, and it's bubblegum pink, and it's silk, and it's kind of um, avant-garde shaped with these kind of, not ruffles, but just shapes. And I was like, can I have that dress? I will wear it to something important for you in England. And she was like, would you actually? And I wore it to the British Fashion Awards and was in all these lovely lists um, and showed her. And she was so moved that I had taken a piece of her work to this important place. And it was seen by these fashion eyes, which was important to her and changed what she wants to do. And I felt like I'd taken this dress on this journey which is probably why I like secondhand clothes when journey is just journey and story and people are just within them. So I think that dress is, I now look at it every time I think, and also it was my first ever British fashion was terrifying. <laughs> oh my God, scariest red carpet ever. It is quite scary, oh. isn't it? And it took a lot of like, come on, let's just do this. And so I was very proud of myself for kind of doing it. And so funny, cause this year I was now then working on it and I was like, <laughs> whatever. Like, it's just like, <laughs> If when you're scared of something, you must do it because the other side is just like it does get rid of that fear and suddenly you just completely just just turning sort of to fashion moments. Do you have a fashion moment that you look back on and think, oh my god, a terrible one? 
Yeah. God, yeah. I went to the Where the Wild Things Are premiere when I was like 24. And I thought it would be okay and like a good idea to wear a trilby stroke fedora, which is like not a look that works for me. I do look good in hats, not that hat. <laughs> and, I, and I also dressed a bit like, I don't know, it was like, I think the Libertines time or something. No, it wasn't that time. It was more like indie was big and it's just hideous. And it's and because I did a red carpet, I see it occasionally. I'm like, oh my God, I hate that outfit. Okay, well, on a more positive note, one that you just go back to and think, yes. I think it was that first British Fashion Awards yeah. big dress. I think Sounds it was, like it. Yeah, it was the biggest red carpet I've ever done. And, and uh, I loved that I had done something special with the moment and not just walked up a red carpet in a dress lent to me. Yeah, that's I liked sort that of I was doing magical. That yeah. You, that you were wearing a piece of art. A piece of art and doing something for someone else yeah. that she never thought she could see. She never thought she could see her work somewhere like that. Incredible, generous spirit. Oh. <laughs> Let's talk about travel for a moment. Do you think about your airport look? Yeah. I'm going away tomorrow for a work trip. Very much think about my airport look. What's it going to be? I, I, this is it. My other side, like this is me kind of smart, casual, but... My other size, I love baggy jogging bottoms and big baggy plain jumpers. Um, I get them in like the men's parts of charity shops. Like oh, blue. I love the men's parts yes, of charity shops. Totally. I just got the most brilliant dinner jacket. Yes, the jackets are better. Because yeah. they're not all nipped in. They're kind of big, yeah. oversized. Um, so tomorrow I'll be in like a massive blue Lacoste jumper and big old um, Kappa <laughs> navy <laughs> jogging bottoms. And um, trainers and my very cosy puffer jacket that I'm wearing today. Ooh, gorgeous. I like to be cosy when I'm not on. Have you, are you on a long haul flight? I'm going to Barbados, so seven hours? Yeah, long enough. Yeah, long enough. Obviously, you're doing more with your mum. Do you have opinions on what she wears and does she have opinions on what you wear? I don't know about her opinion on what I wear, but I am obsessed with the story of my mum's style. My mum was never into clothes. She was when she was younger, her and Nana, when they were in a band called Rip, Rig and Panic. Very stylish, creative maniacs, just like dancing around in like African tribal wear and also just like charity shop clothes. They looked banging. But then my mum was really overweight for a long time in the middle of her life and just hid from clothes and decided they weren't something for her. And then five years ago, lost weight, got this huge mainstream job as, as a judge on Great British Menu, which then morphed into her taking over as being the presenter. And it is now like my mother's show. And to watch her style evolve into what it is now has just been extraordinary. She's a black, bald woman in her late 50s on mainstream BBC TV, wearing color and style and, you know, uh, it's like jumpsuits and sequins and pattern print. Her and her fantastic stylist, Shara, they, you know, that wasn't the stylist that the BBC were going to give her. And I said, Mum, just like, just keep it down, take their stylist. Because and you've she, got to feel at home in your yes. clothes. Yes. And she said, no, I, I, I won't wear what they, they think is right. And I think that's a real conditioning of our industry. I'm like, she's lucky enough to have got the job. Don't rustle any feathers. But because she was brave and listened to her gut and worked with this young girl, they've now evolved it into her style being like the secondary thing about the show. So I'm so proud of my mum for stepping into this whole new part of herself and the amount of love we get from women of all ages and men. Men are like, oh, I love what you wear. Um, it's, it's extraordinary to show what, how you can feel beautiful without all the things that people assume are beauty, i.e. hair, yeah. youth, yeah. whiteness. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been beautiful. Do you have a particular charity shop that you always find great things in yes there's um you're not going to share the name are you i am i i, <laughs> I, I am um but there's one i won't <laughs> this one I will. it's more of a jumble sale like it's i like a really charity a real charity shop i don't like um a sort of a uh, vintage shop masquerading as a charity shop. I like it to be almost a jumble sale. And there's a Sue Rider on Essex Road, which is lovely, clean, smells great. Everything's washed and like steamed. And they just have all the best mini skirts. I think I've got maybe six or seven of my favorite mini skirts from there. I think it's because of the all the great Islington chicks around the area <laughs> um, donating. And then there's also a jumble sale place um, on Kaysnov Road in Stoke Newington, which is 
I don't know, but it's, I mean, it's pretty nondescript, but I found these brilliant Paul Smith men's jeans in there for a pound. But so guilty secret, you're talking about all these fantastic finds and three pounds for this and a pound for that. What is the most expensive item of clothing that you've ever bought? I think I have one pair of Manolos that's about 1,200 quid, and I felt kind of weird spending that much money on a pair of shoes, but I am obsessed with them, and I adore them, and I see them as a piece of art. But that's why I've started trying to buy art now, <laughs> because I'm like, it's lovely that you think Shouldn't that, be fashion. But they're not actually <laughs> art. So, yeah. Well, no, I have this thing, actually. I think... The way we hang our clothes, store our clothes, it's part of our lives. And so actually it should be celebrated and should be rather beautiful. Yes, and our, our personal histories are in our wardrobes. You know that the, my wardrobe I didn't just build because it's a nice place for the clothes. It's because everything I've ever been through in my life is in that room and talking to me and reminding me and showing me who I've been and who I am. It's like there's so much conversation in your wardrobe. It, it is so true. And part of this podcast is talking about that journey, that conversation. And I, and I love delving into those journeys. Yeah, me too. I always ask this question, uh, what is your approach to sustainable fashion? Now, I know that you're passionate about secondhand, but what are, do you have any other approaches to sustainability? I mean, I do a big clear out every six months. So we have to because there's so many clothes that need to be bought for t TV shows where you need, we need to tell so more outfits. And what do you do with taking back? I take them back to the charity shops or they go into our storage space. We have, so we, we are building our archive. archive. Mum's worse because mum. We as in you and mum. Me and mum, yeah. Um, mum's worse because mum, every series of Great British Menu needs like 35 new looks or maybe even more. And do you, do you have to retain your key looks to be part of your archive? Is that, is that the thinking? Yes, I think that's, I think more with mum because they're all so, um, I've just got 10 really beautiful cashmere navy jumpers that I want to be looked after. <laughs> but if I see that I have 10, I take six back to the charity shops. I'm like, I do not need this amount because also, because I only really shop in charity shops, if I suddenly run out of navy blue jumpers, I can't just get another one for a fiver at any charity shop. I also like the idea of new stories for these clothes. Mm. You know, I like that I'll be on Sunday brunch wearing a dress that could have been someone wore to like a wedding, their sister's wedding in Hull in like the 70s. And now I'm wearing it to present TV. I really like being part of that story. Okay, on to some quick fire questions. Okay. What fashion advice would you give to your 20 year old self? I'd say stop cutting your tights and wearing them as leggings under skirts it doesn't look good <laughs> <laughs> which fashion trend would you like to see make a comeback grant mitchell or like the mitchell brothers leather jack like leather coats you know they're like straight to the knee and everyone says I look like a security guy, but I think they're chic. I think it looks like Prada. I Men's. love the fact that you have these references, <laughs> these very specific references. Grant Mitchell, leather jackets. He actually knew what was up. <laughs> what fashion or beauty trend would you consign to Room 101? A play suit. Like the denim ones, they were everywhere at one point. Like the, because I love dungarees, but the cut off, they were called something. Everyone used to wear them to festivals and wet themselves. Because oh, they're really hard to take Thanks off. for the detail. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like those. They can, they can go. I've never liked those. 101. Your last impulse buy? Oh, I love it. It was a big lavender. I mean, lavender, Amanda. Like, lavender. Oh, yeah. You're like, in lavender like, today. In lavender it looks today. fantastic on you. Feeling lavender at the moment. A big lavender men's sports jumper. Because I was going to visit my dad in Scotland. He went, by the way, it is so cold here. <laughs> and I was like... But it's always cold. He went, no, even Scottish people are cold. So I went <laughs> nuts. I bought like thermals. And I got there. It really wasn't that cold. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the jumper. What are your views on tattoos? Oh, I have one mistake tattoo that my friend Grimmy did for me, which I hate. Um, I was thinking the other day, do I fancy boys with tattoos? I don't think so. I don't think I like it. Beauty treatment you couldn't give up? Moisturizing. I, I, with almond oil, my whole body, every after every shower. Ooh. Oh, almond oil, delicious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. High end or high street? High end. Bling or bear? Bear. 
Minimalism or maximalism? Minimalism. I love minimalism. <laughs> couture or charity shop? <sighs> charity shop, but I do love to gaze at couture and the shapes. One-off or bog-off? Oh, God, one-off. Crocs, cute or puke? Cute. Sneakers or stilettos? S sneakers. I can't walk in stilettos. That's the other reason I love getting <laughs> heels. I cannot walk in tall heels. I don't know how people do it. Party wear or PJs? PJs. Trend or style? Style. Experimental or uniform? Experimental. Shapewear or sexy lingerie? Sexy lingerie. Tights or stockings? Tights, but they have to be 10 denier. <laughs> <laughs> Bikini or one piece? One piece. I love a speedo. <laughs> Beanie or berry? Uh, I think a beanie. And finally, Makita, one last question. At the end of the day, what do you or don't you wear in bed? I wear men's boxes and nothing else. Is that a bit sexy? <laughs> Super sexy. Super sexy. Makita. I wish I could say I wear silk camisole 90s, but I don't. I love men's boxes. <laughs> Makita, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you Thank about you. all things fashion, style, secondhand, just brilliant. Thank you for making the time to be with me here today. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it so much. And thank you for this view. I'm going to take some pictures if that's okay. <laughs> you go ahead. <laughs> okay. You go ahead. <laughs>